Hello, and thank you for this invitation to the European Society of Regional Anesthesia. The topic for today of this elite meeting is discogenic pain treatment. And I'll be describing both the diagnosis of discogenic pain as well as what treatment options are available to us as clinicians. My name is Kenneth Candido. I'm a professor of surgery and anesthesiology at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. And thank you again for the invitation. A wonderful paper on discogenic pain was recently published by ESA and Associates last year in the International Journal of Molecular Science. It's called Discogenic Pain in the Back, Anatomy, Pathophysiology, and Treatments of Intervertebral Disc Degeneration. To understand discogenic pain, you have to understand the anatomical changes which occur with aging. And those include things like osteophyte formation in taking a normal disc and adding a bony element to it, neovascularization, as well as neo nerve innervation. And we'll talk about that momentarily. Inside the intervertebral disc, which is 70 to 90% aqueous, we see a loss of hydration. We see an imbalance in the gly glycosaminoglycans and the mucopolysaccharides and a change in collagen from type two to type one following Thompson's criteria which occurs in aging in many adults beyond the age of 35. We see bulging of the annulus and we see sensory innervation changes. However, going back 10 years, Nick Bogduck, Charlie April, and Rick Derby postulated that discs can hurt. This was one of their theorems, that discs do hurt and that discs are affected by pathology that can make them hurt. And in formulating these postulates, they looked at the use of provocation discography as a viable tool to assess individuals with back pain as to whether or not the discs were painful. They found that there was a distribution of three pressures in which symptomatic patients reported the reproduction of their pain. Low pressure, about 10 PSI pounds per square inch, approximately 30 pounds per square inch, and then a, a lower percentage of individuals that needed pressurization of their disc to up to 60 PSI. However, they were cautious because they said that looking at imaging following uh, discography, provocation discography, grade three fissures found in the annulus were only found approximately 70% of the time when patients reproduce their pain. So therefore, the correlation between provocation discography and findings like high intensity zone and modic changes was not that significant. There was also only a 70% finding of modic type one or type two changes in the disc on MRI imaging, looking at T2 weighted imaging. Now, what are these modic changes, so-called MODIC, M-O-D-I-C changes. Type one shows bone marrow edema inflammation. Type two is associated with marrow ischemia and where we change the normal red hematopoietic type bone marrow into a yellow fatty type bone marrow. And type three, which is extraordinarily rare, is where you see subchondral bony sclerosis. So these are not consistent findings across the board. Furthermore, internal disc disruption characteristic of discogenic pain is only found in approximately 40% of patients, but all, not all patients with chronic low back pain due to a discogenic source. This is a rendering of the MRI findings on T2-weighted image. The high-intensity zone on the left hand of the sc uh, screen there shows an area of discontinuity in the intervertebral disc, a little white speck, which is consistent with edema and inflammation from a recent annular tear of the intervertebral disc. Modic changes, we've talked about those, are found in the bony matrix and reflect typically things like edema and inflammation with type 1 or marrow ischemia and a change from a red bone marrow into yellow fatty type of bone marrow with type 2. Those are the more common changes associated with discogenic type pain, but again, only seen in approximately 70% of individuals who have discogenic related pain. Now, the high intensity zone is a very interesting concept. This is a beautiful paper published by Yang and Associates last year in the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery and Research that found that high intensity zone positive discs have a significantly higher incidence of consistent pain compared to a normal cohort. Furthermore, this was based upon 28 reports that they looked at in a meta-analysis. The high intensity zone may be a specific indicator for the physical diagnosis of discogenic low back pain. That's a very promising and optimistic look at how the MRI might be useful as a tool without discography for making an assessment of individuals who potentially have discogenic pain without subjecting them to needle puncture and provocation and pressurization of the intervertebral disc. 
Their findings were that on MRI imaging, there's a loss of disc height. There are formation of bony osteophytes, internuclear calcification, and sclerosis of the end plates in some cases. There's also re a reduction in hydration. Recall that the intervertebral disc is 70 to 90% aqueous, and the nucleus is characterized by type 2 collagen, which, of course, changes the type 1 collagen characteristic of the annulus over time and with advancement of the disease. There's also an ingrowth, which is induced of sensory nerve fibers. We call this hyper -innervation. I'll talk about the innervation of the disc momentarily. So discogenic pain is a classic nociceptive type pain in most cases. That means that there's some type of stimulus, the degeneration of the nucleus of the intervertebral disc, which leads to transduction, transmission, modulation, and perception, ultimately with pain expression in the central nervous system. The nucleus is aqueous. There's also proteoglycans and type 2 collagen found inside the nucleus pulposus, as well as some proteins. The annulus is typ typified by type 1 collagen. The annulus consists of 15 to 50 parallel concentric lamellae overlapping like the skin of an onion, for example, and at, at, exists at about a 60 degree angle from the vertical. The posterior portion of the annulus is thinner than the anterior portion, which is why disc bulging typically occurs with pressurization posteriorly in contradistinction to, a, to anterior annular bulges. They can occur. There can also be Schmerl's nodes where the annulus bulges all the way up into the vertebral body due to high pressurization. And that's been described for almost 90 years now. The blood supply is the metaphyseal anastomoses and the innervation are branches of the sympathetic nervous system. The aging disc leading to discogenic pain goes through the several stages of the Thompson criteria. Number one stage, loss of cells. This tends to occur in younger individuals, maybe in their 30s, 35 to 40. Then there's a loss of water and a loss of proteoglycans. There's a change of type 2 collagen to type 1 collagen in the nucleus. Type 1 collagen, once again, is characteristic of the annulus, not the nucleus in younger individuals. Annular radial fissures develop. There are mechanical incompetence changes, and ultimately there are bony osteophytic changes. These are known as Thompson criteria. Now, these are two intervertebral discs of the L4, L5 level. The disc on the left was taken out of a 23-year trauma uh, victim who died by motor vehicle accident. The disc on the right is from a 92-year individual who died of natural causes. But you can see morphologically the changes that occur with the aging disc, the changes in collagen from type 2 to type 1 in the nucleus. And we can postulate that the disc on the right could potentially be a source of pain of a discogenic nature. Where is the fibers and the, 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 the nerve fibers and where are the pain generators located in the disc? Typically in the outer third of the annulus fibrosis. And the nerve endings come from three sources, the sinew vertebral nerve, the gray rami communicantes, and the lumbar ventral rami. Now, the gray rami communicantes innervate the anterolateral and the posterior lateral annulus. In the ipsilateral outer third to outer half of the annulus, we find the ventral ramus. And the all-important sinew vertebral nerve it innervates the posterior annulus, the anterior dural sac, as well as the sleeve of the dura. And I'll show you a graphic of how this innervation occurs on the next slide. And here it is. Posteriorly, we see the sinew vertebral nerve laterally, laterally and posteriorly, the ventral ramus. And then laterally, from posterior to annular, we see the gray rami communicantes. Now, the sinew vertebral nerve has received a lot of attention both historically and, and in recent time. This is a beautiful paper, which was published by Quinones and Associates in the European Spine Journal in 2021. I encourage all of you to avail yourself of this report, which details the anatomical considerations and implications of the sinew vertebral nerve as it relates to discogenic pain in the lumbar spine, especially. It's a great review of the literature. Please download and read this article by Quinones and Associates. So not only are their innervation areas of the disc, but those nerves contain seven mediators of pain and inflammation. And they include histamine, lactic acid, bradykinin, substance P, calcitonin, gene-related peptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and phospholipase A2. In fact, historically, we've focused on phospholipase A2 as part of the metabolic pathway of arachidonic acid because we know, for example, that corticosteroids can neutralize in many cases, phospholipase A2. It's an antidote to that chemical in particular, which can egress from damaged or in, injured intervertebral discs. And that's one of the foundations or premises or bases for performing 
epidural steroid injections, for example, but all of these chemicals are characteristic of nociception. So what do we have available to us as clinicians to modulate or ameliorate or try to minimize pain and suffering related to discogenic pain? Let's talk about discectomy. Of historical interest mostly are the techniques of percutaneous disc, disc decompression. And the approach to the disc is as would be accomplished using provocation discography. Here I'm performing an L4, L5 percutaneous lumbar disc decompression using a device made by Stryker, no longer commercially available. I've outlined my target at the superior articulating process near the junction of the SAP and the transverse process on lateral oblique fluoroscopy. I'm using a relative gun barrel view to gain access to the central portion of the nucleus pulposus. We see that here on lateral imaging. And then I've activated this rotating auger. It rotates at 10,000 revolutions per minute. Now, the premise behind this approach is that the rotational auger uses Archimedes' principle to drag nuclear material from the inner portion of the disc along the shaft of the auger all the way to a collecting chamber. And you can see I'm holding in my hand, in my left hand, the collecting chamber with a specimen of nuclear material. And here I am actually scraping the nuclear material into a collecting cup. And you can see I've taken large segments of nucleus from this individual patient, 1.85 actual uh, 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 Mill, um, milliliters of actual disc material were removed under these circumstances in this patient. And here I'm, I'm showing a tissue forceps and the auger tip to show for size comparison, the piece of disc, the largest piece of disc that I removed from this patient, a patient who was suffering from discogenic type pain. And there's the collecting cup there. Now, does this translate with a literature review to something which is efficacious? A pain physician going back 11 years stated no. This is an article by Dr. Manchik. Manchikanti, president of ASIP, looking at percutaneous lumbar mechanical disc decompression using this striker decompressor. And they found only five articles considered for inclusion. Of those, only three met the criteria. And this systematic review found only limited evidence for the use of percutaneous disc decompression with the decompressor device. However, nucleoplasty, a minimally invasive procedure for disc decompression, was looked at a year later, a systematic review and meta-analysis of published clinical trials. This is a paper from Eichen and Associates, and they found more studies now, 27 eligible studies, of which 22 were prospective and five were retrospective. Now we're talking about a little bit of a different type of technique, plasma disc decompression or nucleoplasty here. And they found that pain diminished from 7.27 on average at baseline to 2.12 on the first post-operative day. So that's relatively enthusiastic and optimistic. They also found improvement in the Oswestry Disability Index with a baseline of 58.95, which dropped down to about half, 28.60 at one week, and continued to be stable for up to two years. So it's a nice indication that discectomy may be a viable technique for some individuals with discogenic pain and herniated intervertebral discs. Well, we also have available to us regenerative medicine, and there's a great deal of controversy as to whether or not regenerative medicine is suitable for individuals with discogenic pain. The premise underlying regenerative medicine, of course, is that it, it relies upon the essential body uh, ability of the body to heal itself and fosters innate repair mechanisms while supplementing those mechanisms with homologous or autologous biological agents. And you can see that we're looking at a change in interleukin factors and tumor necrosis factor alpha and other chemicals which are implicated uh, as being part of the nociceptive pathway for discogenic pain. Here I am in my clinic preparing to perform an intradiscal injection of autologous platelet-rich plasma for an individual with discogenic type pain. So the study's going back approximately 10 years now. This is a nice review paper on the biological treatment of mild and moderate intervertebral disc degeneration by Basilides and Associates looked at the use of mesenchymal stem cells primarily, both in animal species as well as in humans, and synthesized in a large systematic review all the articles known to that point in time as to a possible potential mechanism for the benefits, the salubrious benefits of using cells to manage discogenic pain. They looked at intradiscal injections in dogs, in pigs, in rabbits, and in cows, for example, and also in humans. And they found in some studies that there was an increased proteoglycan synthesis in vivo, as well as no clinical improvement in other studies, and increased TIMP1 and, and messenger RNA and protein expression in other studies, for example, with intradiscal injection. Their conclusions were that 
cells, mesenchymal stem cells in particular, could potentially differentiate into nucleus pulposus chondrocyte-like cells by virtue of the exogenous application of growth factors found in mesenchymal stem cells, and that this cell differentiation could lead to proliferation, and this proliferation could lead to increasing productivity of new and healthier cells to replace older and damaged cells, which, again, is somewhat of a theoretical construct. Turning our attention to platelet-rich plasma for a moment, here's a paper from Zhang, which was published in 2022 on the intradiscal application of PRP for discogenic low back pain, a nice study of 48 patients followed out for 48 weeks. So almost one consecutive year looking at both pain as well as physical functionality using the SF36 matrix. And you can see that at every time point, pain was improved after intradiscal PRP as well as was functionality. So a nice study in support of the use of platelet-rich plasma for discogenic pain in adults and in humans. However, a large meta-analysis, single arm by Pang, published uh, last year in the journal Medicine, found less robust evidence in favor of PRP for discogenic low back pain. And here the evidence is actually showing relatively flat findings across the board compared to uh, PRP treatment using an intradiscal approach. Uh, you can see here on the graphic A, B, and C where the different studies looked at over time going back from 2016 and 2017, looking at PRP versus controls. While the study demonstrated that in a uh, discal injection of PRP may be safe and effective for discogenic low back pain, in point of fact, there was no significant change in patient's pain at one, two, and six months after the PRP treatment. And so that uh, gives us pause for concern as well as to the relative benefits and utility of PRP in the low back. Now, bone marrow concentrate has been used by many investigators to study the effects of mesenchymal stem cells on disc nucleus repair. And here's a nice paper from Tendulkar and Associates calling it hype or hope because we really don't know. Bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells have been shown to differentiate in some cases into nucleus pulposus-like cells and in some cases to stimulate the production of new cell matrix. So this is an important paper showing, again, that we can go back to that type 2 collagen in some cases with mesenchymal stem cells inject, injected intradiscally in cases of discogenic low back pain. Here's a paper, a systematic review and single arm meta-analysis published now six years ago in the journal Spine by Wu and colleagues who looked at six studies where lumbar uh, discogenic pain was treated with mesenchymal stem cells pluripotent uh, uh, mesenchymal cells derived from bone marrow, essentially. And what they found was that with these six studies, there was a 44.2 point decrease in pooled mean pain scores, as well as a 32.2 point difference from baseline in the Oswestry Disability Index in those individuals who received bone marrow derived or bone marrow concentrate mesenchymal stem cells, pluripotent cells. Based on these systematic reviews, they found, Wu and associates found that there was level three evidence in favor of the use of intradiscal injections of bone marrow concentrate for discogenic pain. A very important paper here in Transplantation 2017 published by David Noriega and associates titled Intervertebral Disc Repair by Allogenic Mesenchymal Bone Marrow Cells. This was a randomized control trial. And it's important because they studied a large group of patients, 24, the test group received 25 million bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells with an intradiscal injection. The control group received the sham injection, which was merely infiltration into the paravertebral mus musculature. And what they found was that not only was pain improved for up to 12 months, so it's a longitudinal study going out for 12 consecutive months, but also at the same time, disability index and lumbar pain was improved in all individuals who received mesenchymal stem cells uh, intradiscally in this study. Nice paper by Christopher Centeno uh, of 33 patients, a pilot study, treatment of lumbar degenerative disc disease with radicular pain. Now, this is a little bit moving away from discogenic pain. And the reason I included this study was because stem cells were found not only to be effective in reducing pain, but this study was unique because they did post-treatment MRIs. And the post-treatment MRIs documented in 85% of individuals had a reduction in disc bulge size 
and the average reduction in that disc bulge at the affected treated level with mesenchymal stem cells was about 23%. So that's about one fourth of the bulge that existed before the injection of mesenchymal stem cells. Dr. Patin did a, a dose response study, which was unique with, by virtue of the fact that they looked at 26 patients, it's autologous bone marrow concentrate, injected intradiscally again, again for the treatment of degenerative disc disease, and they had a three-year follow-up. So this is one of the longest follow-ups on record. And they found, importantly, that of these 26 patients, only six progressed to needing neurological surgery to manage their pain related to disc degeneration. They also looked at a dose-response effect and found that the average CD34 positive was 1.82 million per ml in the bone marrow concentrate, and that patients with greater concentrations of colony-forming units slash F greater than 2,000 per ml and CD34 positive cells of greater than 2 million per ml tend to have better clinical improvement. So it's a dose-response study looking at the effectiveness of altering the concentrations of cells. And in this study, the conclusion was that there was evidence of safety and feasibility of intradiscal bone marrow concentrate as an alternative to surgery. Now, while this is an optimistic study, more recent data would tend to dispute these findings, and I'll go through that momentarily. Besides bone marrow concentrate, are there other sources of autologous material, or if not autologous material, heterologous material for the use of deriving mesenchymal stem cells? Let's, look, let's take our attention and turn our attention now to autologous adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells. And again, this is a study by Kumar looking at discogenic pain titled The Safety and Tolerability of Intradiscal Implement Implantation of Combined Autologous Adipose-Derived Mesenchymal Stem Cells and Hyaluronic Acid in Patients with Chronic Discogenic Pain. And it was a one-year one follow-up published in 2017 in Stem Cell Research Therapy. Only 10 patients were studied. They looked at two dose response phenomena related to autologous cells derived from the adipose tissue, 20 million cells per disc versus 40 million cells per disc and it's, important, it's an important study because it showed no difference whether or not 20 million cells per disc were injected versus 40 million cells per disc, and there was no, therefore no intergroup variability. Another important study, this was one that I had the privilege to contribute to through the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. Uh, Dr. Navani was the lead author. It was published in our journal, Pain Physician, now going on five years ago. It was to generate some guidelines for the reliable, responsible, safe, and effective use of biologics. And by biologics, I'm including platelet-rich plasma and mesenchymal pluripotent stem cells for the management of discogenic pain or pain in the low back related to disc degeneration. So our objective was to provide guidelines for the safe use of these biologics and to create guidelines that could be readily implemented in daily clinical interventional pain management practice. What did we find? Turning our attention to PRP, we found that there was level three evidence on a scale of one through five in favor of the use of PRP intradiscally for the management of low back pain conditions. As relates to mesenchymal stem cells, we found the same level of evidence, level three evidence on a scale of level one through level five in favor of the use of mesenchymal stem cells for the management of low back pain due to disc degeneration. The evidence has been challenged more recently in 2023, and I will show you the data, which tends to be casting aspersions or some doubt upon, upon the relatively robust findings that we had when we created this document back now going on about five years ago. If you look at this graphic, these are reports of the use of PRP, platelet-rich plasma, for discogenic pain, low back pain due to disc degeneration at six months and at 12 months. So at, at both six months and at 12 months, there was a positive influence of discal injection of platelet-rich plasma in individuals suffering from discogenic type pain. The next phase of our study was looking at cell therapy for lumbar disc degeneration and discogenic pain. When I say cell therapy, I'm talking about mesenchymal stem cells. And there was a 12 month follow-up at first, followed by greater than 12 months uh, uh, looking at pain and disability. So the first part of this slide shows the pain response to the use of mesenchymal stem cells in individuals with discogenic pain showing favor for the cell use. And the lower half of the slide shows the oswestry disability index has also changed in favor of individuals who received cells. Our conclusion essentially was that 
If a patient has a need for biological therapy, this should be conducted on an individual basis while discussing risks, benefits, and alternatives with the patient and eliminating or excluding alternative options that may be less invasive and in some cases less costly for the patient, remembering that PRP, while expensive, is not nearly as expensive as the use of procedures to provide mesenchymal stem cells. And of course, you have to follow the regulatory agencies in your respective location or country or state that may have oversight on the use of biologics for this purpose. Now, more recently, a systematic review published in the Journal of Pain Research in 2022 by her and associates was called the analgesic efficacy of intradiscal injection of bone marrow aspirate concentrate, as well as culture expanded bone marrow mesenchymal stromal cells for discogenic pain. And this study looked at a total of 764 articles. Actually, the data here was much less supportive of the use of cells compared to the findings of ACIP and the publication in Pain Physician Journal in 2019. Again, this is now only two years old. And based on the great assessment, there's very low quality evidence that bone marrow aspirate concentration and culture expanded bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells are effective in reducing pain and disability as well as inducing positive anatomical change. This was a large attempt, which tends to minimize our, prim our primary conclusions made five years ago. This would tend to, tend to negate them in many cases. The study overall supported modest efficacy in treating discogenic pain and improving functional outcomes using bone marrow aspirate concentrations or mesenchymal cell injections. However, the level of certainty for, uh, for the potential associations made in this review is low as documented by very low grade evidence to support these conclusions. Another paper which was less than enthusiastic was by one of my good friends, Zachary McCormick, who's published extensively or exhaustively on the use of uh, modalities to manage discogenic as well as low back pain, as well as cervical pain for that matter. And they looked and published in the Spine Journal in 2022, the effectiveness of intradiscal biologic treatments for discogenic low back pain. This was a systematic review uh, that looked at the literature for both PRP or stem cells for treating discogenic type pain. And patients with discogenic low back pain that were confirmed to have this condition by provocation discography were included for consideration. And success as determined the primary outcome was the proportion of individuals who had a 50% or greater pain relief after intradiscal biological injections at the six month period. What they found of these 37 studies, which were identified for inclusion, was that the evidence supporting the use of intradiscal mesenchymal stem cells and platelet rich plasma was of a very low quality, so less than level three, which tells me that as we go further on and more studies are conducted and completed, the evidence doesn't seem to be as robust or as favorable as many of the early reports tended to be. Here's a nice paper by Dr. Ju and Associates, which was published in 2022 in the Global Spine Journal. Is there clinical improvement associated with intradiscal therapies? This was a comparison across randomized controlled trials, which included a saline placebo with intradiscal active biological agents. And the conclusion of these authors was that there is no significant difference in visual analog scores between saline investigational groups at up to 12 months. So again, another look at some negative data more recently accruing, which tends to cast aspersions against the use of biologics for discogenic type pain. I include this paper by the late Greg Lutz, colleague of ours uh, who, who worked at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Dr. Lutz was very aggressive and enthusiastic about creating pathways and using biologics for managing discogenic pains. He did some of the earliest studies on the use of PRP, for example, published good results. And unfortunately, regrettably, last month, he died of a colon cancer, but he was a tremendous investigator. And he talked about the use of uh, intradiscal orthobiological uh, in interventions for discogenic pain. And he raised some cautionary tales about the possibility of discitis occurring and that they recommended using dis uh, intradiscal gentamicin in all their patients receiving biologics. Now, I've done a lot of biological injections into the disc space, and my preference is for the use of cefazolin or ANSEF, but I have no quarrels with those who would select an alternative, such as either clindamycin or gentamicin for that purpose. Discitis is an ever-lurking threat whenever we breach the outer annulus and gain access to the inner nucleus pulposus. Intradiscal 
injections can be associated with a one in 4,000 risk of discitis if no antibiotics are utilized, but with antibiotics being utilized, the risk should be substantially less. So my conclusions are as follows. Discogenic pain is an ever-present lurking problem in the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine, and it's a challenge for those of us who are interventionalists for managing chronic pain. We have available several, several possible options to us to address this condition, including things like percutaneous removal of nuclear material, again, not supported at all or strongly by literature in some cases. And in some cases, percutaneous discectomy has shown favorable evidence. Discectomy and nucleoplasty, which are not supported by great high-level prospective randomized and controlled trials, but they do offer a methodology for individuals who are attempting to avoid conventional neurosurgical remedies for this condition. Intradiscal PRP, safe, economic, and somewhat effective. According to our review, it was a level three type of evidence. More recent uh, reviews, including those of Dr. McCormick and others with 10 to indicate that the evidence is less robust. Bone marrow concentrate or adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells, or in some cases, if you go to a location where they don't have uh, regulatory agencies uh, actually monitoring the use of placental or Wharton's jelly-derived cells, they have been found by some investigators to be useful. Again, the ACIP guidelines found level three evidence, but in other circumstances have not been found to be very useful. Uh, from a, a, a clinical situation, they may be beneficial, but by an evidentiary uh, review, not so good. Mesenchymal stem cells are also much more expensive than platelet-rich plasma. So make sure that when you consider regenerative medicine or biological therapy for your patients, you apprise them of the expense, you apprise them of the risks, and you also apprise them of what the real evidence shows, both in favor of their use as well as against their use. I wish to thank the European Society of Regional Anesthesia for uh, inviting me, especially Professor Jose de Andres, and all of you who have participated in this Congress. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Be, be well, be safe, and goodbye.